right, guys, here we go. You ready for this? It's the book that I'm going to read today, speed read and memorize, is The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Boop by Mark Manson. Uh, I'm going to speed read this book, and then I am going to memorize it and come back and give you the points that I learned from this book. It's about 8.30 in the morning right now. What's going to make this a tough day is for four hours, I'm going to be teaching a memory course inside this building with two of my friends, Todd Stottlemyre and Kyle Wilson, and I'm going to be have to find time to read this book this afternoon in one hour, speed read it, and then come back and teach you what I learned from it. It's going to be a tough day. It's going to be a big challenge for speed reading and black belt memory, but let's see if I can do it. Let's go. Well, that's it. Seminar's done. I did my speech, and then I sat at the back of the room after my speech was over, and I read this book very fast. I did get a little bit of a head start on it before the speech last night, but uh, I think I've got 15 pages left. I'm going to head to my hotel, finish this up, and then I'll be right back with you with uh, the subtle art of not giving a I sit down right now to memorize the book and start filming the videos and I get a text message. Hey Ron, we got to meet. We're going to dinner. We're going to talk about the seminars. So right now I am putting this on hold and I'm going to go have dinner and uh, then I'm going to come back to this. Now I'm getting ready to go back to the hotel and finish speed reading and memorizing this book. And when I get there, I'm going to tell you what that book is all about. I'm finished. I read this book essentially uh, in today in between in, in my breaks. I do have a system on speed reading. And essentially, I read the front cover. I read the back cover. I read the table of contents. I read the, the bold chapter headings. That tells me what the author really wants me to zone in on. And then I read with a pen and I highlight and underline as I go. And then when I get to the end of the book, I have all these things highlighted and underlined and I just go back and then I memorize those, those things using my black belt memory system. Uh, by the way, if you're always wondering about what my memory system is, down below in the, in the description section, I have a free, uh, a free gift for you that kind of introduces you to uh, memory and how I memorize and all that stuff. But now let me tell you what I learned from this book. He starts off with a story about a guy named Charles Bukowski. And this Charles guy, he um, he was a failure in life. You know, he was drinking all the time, making, not making no money. He was a writer. Nobody liked his work. And then finally, at 50 years old, uh, he gets this opportunity to to write. And uh, he, he wrote a novel in three days. He called it The Post Office. And he becomes this overnight success or sensation. But he, this guy just didn't give a... Boop. Matter of fact, on his tombstone, he, the, he on his tombstone, the epitaph that said, "Don't try." The smaller the dog, the louder the bark. In other words, he was saying people try too hard. So if a person is really rich, they don't have to prove to you that they're rich. That people oftentimes try too hard. They they care too much about stupid. Thing. Caring about the wrong things is what leads to unhappiness. And he makes the point that people are always trying to, oh, you know what, I'm going to be happy one day when I when I weigh 10 pounds less, or when I'm sexier, or when I'm more fit, or when I make more money, or when I get that job promotion. And they're constantly, constantly on this treadmill focused on that ultimate end goal. It's not about not caring about anything. That's not what this book is about. It's not like, hey, I don't care about anything. It's about finding what it is that is important to care about. He said there's something, a psychologist named Alan Watts, and he said Alan Watts had this thing called the backwards law, where it's really counterintuitive. And the idea was the more you focused on, on happiness, I'm going to be happy, I'm going to pursue that house, I'm going to pursue, pursue that car, I'm going to pursue this amount of money. The more you focused on pursuing that and that, the less happy you would be because the more aware you would be that you don't have it. The more you focus on positive, chasing positive things, the more negative of experience that is for you. But the more you embrace that negativity is a part of life, that is actually a positive experience. So he wasn't, he was, he was actually saying when you care less about certain things, it's actually positive. Or right, Mark, are you saying that it's, 
when I care less about making money or I care less about, about advancing in my career, it's a positive thing. That's exactly what he's saying. He's saying when you care less about certain things, it's a positive thing. And he, he, he argued it this way. He said you're probably actually going to do better when you care less. And that made sense to me because in my life, I've thought about the times, you know, like I'm in high school. I really liked that girl. Oh, I liked her so much. And I cared so much about what she thought. When I talked to her, I sounded like an idiot. And then with the girls that that I didn't care about when I talked to them I sounded like a cool guy and that was one of his points that when you care less it actually eases up your self you become more charismatic you become natural and you will become actually better but now he did make a big point here he said this book this book is not about becoming indifferent. It's not about just being, okay, I'm indifferent. I don't care. I'm, I'm indifferent. Yeah, whatever happens. He said it's not about being indifferent. It's, he said it's about being okay with being different. That's big. It's not about being indifferent to everything. It's about being okay being different. In other words, not pursuing what society says you have to have to pursue. If you are offended by everything, if you get offended by everything, if you your ex-boyfriend puts a picture up on Facebook and you, or you get upset about that, you get upset because, oh my gosh, they just did that sale at the store and I missed that sale and I'm not going to get the two for one deal. If you are getting upset over every little thing, it's because you don't have one big thing or something big in your life that you really care about. And he makes the point that when we're all little babies, we all get upset over everything. My hat! Oh, my hat's not blue or, or, or whatever. Or I want my toy. We get upset about everything, but we have to mature and we have to get past that. We have to not care about everything. We just have to care about the right things. And I'll tell you what the right things are in a minute. So stay tuned. He said his book is not about gaining and achieving. It's about losing and letting go. And then in chapter two, he goes into talking about uh, Buddha and he talks about how this guy in Nepal, he was really rich and his, his father wanted to shield him from, from all adversity. So he lived a really rich and comforted life. And then when this boy grew up and realized he was living this shielded life, he rejected it and he went and lived in the streets of Nepal in ultimate poverty. And after a couple of years of living in ultimate poverty, he's like, you know what? This sucks too. And then the the, the young prince came to the realization having a lot, a lot of money causes suffering because you have all this money and you're not you're not experiencing really all of life and you're not achieving and you're not you're that adversity you don't have adversity and that's actually good for you but on the flip side of it poverty is very bad because you're cold you're starving you're malnourished so there's suffering suffering is all throughout life this person actually was the Buddha um, and he actually you might have heard of him right and he came up with this idea that life is about suffering and we're all going to suffer. Happiness is an unsolvable problem. Happiness is an unsolvable problem. He says, and the more that we chase happiness, the more we, the less we are satisfied with, with what we currently have. Because we're here, we're like, oh my gosh, I want that over there. Then you get that and you're like, oh my gosh, I want that over there. He, he was saying that pain is part of the human experience. Suffering is part of the human experience. And we don't need to try to escape it, but we need to use it to spur us on. But the key, the secret is, is to find the problems that you enjoy solving. Find the problems that excite you. And that's when you'll be successful. Uh, he said in, in, in regards to problems, there are two things that can happen to you. Number one, you could uh, end up uh, being in denial. The problems don't exist, which that's bad. Another thing that you end up happening is you live in victimhood. Oh my gosh, these problems are happening to me and I have no control over them. That's obviously very bad because you're not going to change them if you feel like you don't have control over them. He called it the hedonic treadmill where you're just always on this treadmill pursuing more and more and more and you never actually get to enjoy happiness in the moment because your happiness is always contingent on achieving that next thing, that next house, that next promotion, that girl or that guy or whatever. He uses the example of he wanted to be a rock star. So he got a, 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 a guitar out, he started practicing, and then he just gave up right away. I mean, like after a few lessons, he gave up. And he came to the realization that he wanted to be a rock star, but he didn't want to go through the adversity to get to being a rock star. So really, he didn't want to be a rock star, and he was okay with that. But he makes a really strong point here, and this is a big, 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 big point. And the big point is the people 
who are successful at things in life are people who enjoy the struggle. They enjoy the adversity. The people who get really, really fit at the gym are people who enjoy the adversity and the struggle of getting fit. People who build a successful business are the people who enjoy the adversity and the struggle of building a business. The more you struggle, the, the more you're going to achieve this level of success was his hypothesis. And in this, he makes a point and he says, you are not special. And he said, the problem of, uh, of this with society is everybody feels they're special. Everybody feels they're special and important and better than everybody else. And you see it on Facebook, you know, you're sitting there and you're like, oh my gosh, 18 people just got married. This 20 year old just made $2 billion because they created this app that delivers toilet paper to your house and you're like seeing all these positive things and you're back there uh, you know declawing your cat you know or clipping your toenails or whatever and you're like man I'm special I'm special you know why am I not achieving I'm special too and he comes out and he says you're not special None of us are special. All the problems you're experiencing right now, somebody else, a million people have experienced them. So you're like, oh my gosh, well, if I'm not special, then what? You know, what's the point? And he goes back to making the point, the people that are successful are successful because they realized they weren't special. They realized how ordinary they were. So they had to work so, 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 so hard. And that led them to becoming uh, special or achieving more. Um, how it's okay to be ordinary. It's okay to embrace the fact that you're not going to have this magical Facebook feed life every single day of your life. Most days of your life are going to be very, very ordinary. And he said the key to happiness, the key to happiness is embracing that. Finding value in the things that are simple, the value in things that are ordinary, being a good person, being honest, helping the poor, caring about others. Those are things that you can control. They're ordinary, but they're in their ordinariness, there is greatness. He asked, what metric are you measuring your life by? Um, you might say, well, me and my brother, we don't have a good relationship because we don't see each other four days a week. Well, do you and your brother respect each other, even though you don't see each other but a couple times a year? Yeah, we respect each other. Well, you have, see, if you measure it by how the freak, your relationship by the metric of how frequency you see each other, you have a bad relationship. But if you measure it by the metric we respect each other, you have a good relationship. He questions you to think about what metric you measure your life and your success by. He goes on to talk about um, two, two people who measured their life by two different metrics. One guy was kicked out of the band Metallica and he goes on to create another band called Megadeth. They sold millions and millions and millions of albums but he always saw himself as a failure. The guy who got kicked out of Metallica because their success was so much greater than Megadeth. Then he tells the story of a guy who got kicked out of the Beatles. And that guy, in the year 2000, somewhere around there, gave an interview and said he was happier with his life being kicked out of the Beatles than he probably was with it. Well, how could that be? He said he's happier because he met this woman, he fell in love with her, and they have kids and a family. The guy who got kicked out of Metallica, was the metric he was measuring his life by was how many albums he sold in proportion to Metallica. The guy who got kicked out of the Beatles was measuring his success by how happy and content he was and how much he cared about his family. So two different metrics, two different results. And then he goes on to talk about bad things to, to measure your life by is pleasure. If you're just always seeking pleasure, you're going to be anxious. He talks about if you're, all, if you're, all, if you're materialistic, you're always just going to be pursuing the next dollar. He said he said there's studies, scientific studies that have proven that once you reach a certain dollar level, your happiness will not increase. People who are always happy, I gotta always be happy. If I'm always, I gotta always be happy. Oh, my car just got wrecked. Oh, I'm gonna be happy about that. If you're if you're always forcing yourself to be happy in situations where you're, you shouldn't be happy, it's gonna cause emotional distress and dysfunction. So what is it? What should we care about? What are our values? He says you should base your values on three things. Good values are based on if they're realistic, socially constructive, they help society, and if, they're, uh, if they are immediate and controllable. Conversely, bad values, they are superstitious, not realistic, they are socially destructive, not constructive, and they are not immediate and they are not controllable. For example, a good value would be honesty. Honesty is a good value. 
because uh, it's realistic, you can be honest, it's socially constructive, it helps society, and it's immediate and it's controllable. You can control whether you are honest and you can be honest right away. A destructive value would be seeking popularity, being popular. Not realistic to always be popular. It's socially destructive to try to always be popular. It's self-centered on you. And it is not immediate. And it's definitely not controllable. You can't control if people think you're popular or not. Hey, he kind of shifts the book a little bit uh, at this point. The first half of this book was find the things that are important to you to care about. It's the subtle art of not giving a fuck is not about not caring about anything. It's about finding what are the right things to care about. Um, then he kind of shifts over in, 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 in this book. He talks about things that you should care about is uh, number one, realizing that you have the power to choose. You are responsible. In all circumstances, you are responsible. And when you accept that, when you accept you are responsible, when you choose that, it gives you great power. With great responsibility comes great power. With great power comes great responsibility. So the more uh, 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 responsibility and the more you choose responsibility for your life, the more power you have. Uh, somebody robs you. Were you responsible for that? Not the action, not the past tense, but you are responsible for the present tense, how you are going to respond to being robbed. Somebody leaves a baby on your doorstep. You open up a door and somebody's left a baby on your doorstep. Was that your fault that they left that baby there? No, that's not your fault. But now you're responsible for what you need to do with that baby. So you are always responsible for your life. It removes you from being a victim. And he goes on to say that's what's wrong with society today. There's this victimhood. Everybody's a victim. And it's like, oh my gosh, I'm a victim. He talks about you. If you share on Facebook, oh my gosh, I'm a victim. Or this is an injustice. This is an injustice. Here are some victims. This is an injustice. He'll talk about how society and social media is so addicted to people being victimized and social injustice. It'll get a million shares and a million likes and everybody will get outraged because everybody is a addicted to being outraged. They are addicted to being victims. They're addicted to social injustice because it makes them feel uh, morally superior. It makes them feel on a morally righteous, a moral high ground if they are outraged at this injustice. So he talks about the power to choose and the power of responsibility. He goes on to talk about the power of accepting you're wrong. What if you are wrong? What if you are wrong? So he really asks you to con confront yourself with a couple questions. What if I'm wrong about whatever belief you have? What does it mean if I'm wrong? And would the world be a better place if I was wrong? And you're like, whoa, what if I'm wrong? Question, question if you're wrong. And he talks about how Aristotle said, the, uh, an in intelligent mind entertain a thought without having to accept it. So just because you're questioning if you're wrong, it doesn't mean you're accepting it. It just means you're questioning it. And your thought process is, it's me against the world. All these people are wrong and I'm right. If it's you against the world, everybody else is wrong but you, it's probably not you against the world. It's probably you against you. The odds of everybody else being wrong, if, if everywhere you go you get the same reaction and people are responding to you the same way, it's probably not everybody else is wrong. It's probably you are wrong. And you need to ask yourself, am I wrong? He talks about being able to say no. He talks about going on a trip to Europe and he was on a date with a woman from Russia and at the table, she just said to him, you are stupid. And he said it was in their culture. They didn't have to put up this facade of being nice or whatever. They just said what they think. He said it was so liberating. It was so liberating to not live in that facade, just stay with, say what you think, and just to say no to people. He said rejection actually makes you stronger. He said, but when we live in a society in the West, in the United States, where we're all about uh, living, putting up facades, uh, saying yes to everything, trying to make people like us, and there's no power in that. He said there's power in no. There's power in rejection. There's power in being authentic. And he says, you know, when you reject something, you're actually embracing something else. For example, he's married. 
And so he said, you know what? If I reject doing cocaine with a bunch of hookers in the hotel, I'm actually embracing my wife. Saying no and rejecting to some things is makes my what I do commit to more powerful. Um, he talked about drawing boundaries with people. He's like, some people will say, oh, I could take that job in St. Louis, but I don't want to go to St. Louis because my mom would miss me so much. Or maybe a girlfriend says, I can't believe you said that to me. It made me look stupid in front of those people. When people say those things, they're trying to be a victim and make you responsible for their pain. You've got to draw a boundary and say, I'm not responsible for your pain. Um, he talks about how commitment is actually freeing. How commitment, when you commit to something, it's actually freeing. He did say that when we have a lot of choices, imagine this, you've got 26 pies in front of you and you finally choose one. You, When you have more choices and you choose one, you second guess if your decision was right. But if there was only two pies right there and you chose one of them, the more likely you are to, to be happy with that one choice. The more choices you have, the, the less happy you tend to be when you make your choice. But he says when you do make your choice, Choice. And when you do fully commit to something, you're actually happier. He talked about a time in his life when he traveled the world and went to 50 countries. And then he talked about now in his life when he just settled down in a house and he chose and he committed to this. He's like, that's where the real gold is. That's where after five years you build the deep relationships. When you settle down with just one person and you build that deep relationship, that's where the gold is in the relationship, choosing one thing and settling, committing to it. When you commit, you have more freedom. And then finally, he wrapped up the book about just the, the reality that we're all gonna die, like the Greek Stoics, we're all gonna die. We are going to die. And he goes to this cliff and he peers off the edge of his cliff. You have to be realize you're gonna die and be okay with dying. I'm totally okay if I died at any moment. And when you are, you really don't boop about anything but the important things and the important things are he talks about leaving a legacy and um and he talks about just caring about the important things and realizing that you're going to die and let that motivate you that's a recap of the book folks uh down below i have some memory tips make sure you click that link i'd love you to give me a like i put a lot of work into these videos um i uh, uh spent about i thought i was gonna read this book in an hour i read a little bit of it last night some of it today probably five hours total. I did speed read it and I did memorize it using the black belt memory method. Down below I have some tips on what the black belt memory method is. Please like this video. Please share this video. Comment below what you learned from this video. If you got something really valuable from it, leave me a comment below. What you learned about this? What Did you like the points in the book? What was your favorite point in the book? Uh, so down below I've got a lot of good goodies but please like and share thank you so much for viewing this uh, i'll see you guys on the next video please give me a thumbs up please give me a like and a share thanks guys